want to welcome everybody today to our webinar, Understanding the Pieces of the Long-Term Care Puzzle. And I tell you, it wasn't too hard to come up with the name because um, from professional and personal experience, I have learned it can be complicated. It can be overwhelming. There's so many different areas of service, different criteria, different eligibility criteria, and it can be overwhelming. And so our goal today is to provide some insight to things that are available, um, because whether you are planning for yourself in your future or whether you're a caregiver and you're trying to get information uh, for that loved one that you're caring for, it can feel like you're stuck in a maze. And uh, actually, our uh, caregiver support group read a book, um, Passages in Caregiving, just last week. We were talking about it. And I thought about this last night because it was so relevant for today. And that we can often feel so overwhelmed, you know, like we're in a maze of frustration and confusion, trying to plan for our future or our loved one's future. And we feel like we just keep getting to a dead end and we don't know which way to go. And that's scary. So what we want to do today, an analogy that that author gave in Passages of Caregiving, is that it doesn't have to be a scary maze. It can be like a labyrinth where it's a spiral, where as long as we keep moving, we keep going forward, you know, and the more we move, there's just a support group of people who come around us, whether it's professionals, friends, um, just, uh, you know, getting that tribe of people to support us. And as we do that and we're moving through it together, we find the answers, we get the support. And so that's my goal today, that as we move through this labyrinth, <laughs> the, I don't wanna call it a maze, but just trying to get all the pieces to fit to where, and I know it's unrealistic to think, okay, I'm not gonna have questions in the future. Or I'm gonna map up this plan and it's gonna go exactly as planned. Um, Cause unfortunately that's not life. However, we can definitely have um, the knowledge, the resources to give us more peace of mind and to decrease our stress so we can take a deep breath and know, okay, I've got this. Because if I don't have the answer, I now have this list of people who are experts in their field and they can help me find answers. So that's the goal today. So I am glad all of y'all are here. Uh, we are gonna start with Zandra and let me just introduce Zandra. Um, she is Union County, born and raised. Uh, she currently lives in Wingate. She's married and has a daughter, Abby, who is a rising senior. She's been in healthcare since 1983. The majority of her nursing career uh, is in home health. And more recently, it's been specifically home care. So obviously, those are the two things she's going to be speaking on today. And she um, is with the Council on Aging now, and we feel very blessed to have her here. She's been with us since May of this year. And so she's going to start us off with a little introduction and then talk about home health and home care. So it's all yours, Zandra. Yep, saying to unmute. Um, so I titled it Allowing Our pop Senior Population to Age in Place just because home health and home care seem to be that first step in allowing our seniors to stay in their home um, as long as they can. And a lot of times you hear home health and home care used interchangeably, but there really is a difference even though you hear the term and think they're the same thing. Home health and home care are different. I'm gonna explain the difference, but first I'm gonna share some interesting facts um, and you can flip it to the next one, Jesse. When I was looking up some things, it just seemed like really interesting as to why home health and health, home care are progressively increasing, the needs are increasing. So it was kind of interesting just to see some numbers and I'll let you guys kind of read this, but it's from a 2019 publication. And on the next slide, I'm, you don't have to change it yet, Jesse, but um, there's actually a link to it and you can go. The brochure was really interesting and all of the, the facts that go along with why our needs are increasing today. When I was reading it, like our baby boomers, and of course I'm a baby boomer, are between the ages of 56 and 75 now. Um, they were born between 1946 and 1964. Currently, their population is 69 and a half million with a total population of 328. So it's a pretty large percentage. And of course the baby boomers hold that spotlight for a, a large jump in population from our previous ancestors and previous generations. Prior to the baby boomers, and I thought this was interesting, 
was called the silent generation and it had a population of 21 million. So when you think of us going from 21 million in the previous generation to 69 million in the baby boomer generation, needs change and needs have increased tremendously. And we historically years ago, when I was younger, you heard well, when the baby boomers are gone, population will go back down and that's not the truth. And you'll see if you read some of these numbers in the, in the brochure, our Gen X generation, our millennial generation, our Gen Z generation, they're all following the baby boomers and either at least holding the same population numbers or they're going to exceed, our millennials are going to exceed our baby boomer population. So home care, home health, all of our aging resources, they are gonna, they are gonna be here and they're in place and they're not going anywhere for a little while. Um, if you want to go ahead and switch it, Jesse, they can see the the link to the to the bulletin, to the population bulletin. And like I said, it was it was just really interesting to see all those numbers. So hopefully we the baby boomers will be able to help carve away for that aging in place for the generations to come, the generations to come will be able to, to perfect it, hopefully. Um, but as you can see with the numbers, it just shows how our resources, there's just such a big increase in the need for resources. So when I think about, and you can go on to the next one if you want to, Jesse. So when I think about home health and home care, I'm going to start with home health. Um, home health, you think of generally as clinical services, and they're more medical or clinical in nature. They usually require some type of training or licensure to perform. So like your skilled, your nurses, your physical therapists, speech therapists, um, your medical social workers, it requires some type of skill or skill licensure. It also requires like a change in health status it might be after a hospitalization or a medical event, such as an exacerbation of a diagnosis. It might be a new diagnosis, a new diagnosis of congestive heart failure, but there's usually some health or medical change that requires assistance once they go home or just observation and monitoring. Um, it could be as simple as a medication change that might require a skilled nurse to monitor the efficacy in the home and home health is appropriate for that as well. Now, once home, um, it, it I'll back up a second. Sometimes if they are in a skilled nursing facility, like for rehab after a fractured hip, they may go home with therapy to try to help transition them from that structured environment to their home environment help teach them to um, build a home exercise program to help them be more independent and to maintain that independence. Sometimes your therapies will help them adapt their home to be able to be independent in their bathing or dressing. They'll, they'll help at least guide those changes that they need for showering or bathing, um, dressing, those kind of things. Home health can also involve a great deal of education to the patient, to the caregiver, to the family. It might be a new diabetic that is in need of just education on how to, um, to monitor their diagnosis at home. They may be watching signs and symptoms to be aware of how to treat them when they occur. It might be nutrition, to be aware of your carbohydrate intake, um, how your carbs convert to sugars, or just stabilizing those blood sugars. So education is a huge part in home health. You're really, um, you're teaching that person to kind of be an expert almost in their disease process. Congestive heart failure was a big one for us in how to monitor your daily weights and if you have sudden weight increases, what to do with it and teaching salt intake, um, how to monitor your salt. When I worked in home health, we had little blood vials 
<coughs> I'm sorry, we had little blood vials filled with salt. So when we went in, we would teach them, you know, we're making a turkey sandwich with processed meat, which would be their normal lunch and a little side of chips. And we could take a salt vial and show them how much salt is in their meal. And then that teaches them how to look at their foods. It's a visual for them um, on how to kind of monitor that. Home health can also be wound care, IV injections, um, IV medications, administration of medicines. So generally home health is your clinical or medical in nature. I'll add to that home health is generally visits in the home. So they can last anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour on average. It just depends on the need. An IV or an extensive wound might be longer. It might be an hour, might be an hour and a half. But generally, you can think of a home health visit as around 30 minutes to an hour. They're usually um, like a typical schedule might start out three times a week for a couple of weeks and it'll decrease. So the next couple of weeks, it might be two times a week and then it might decrease to weekly. And then there's a discharge. So there's definitely with your home health, there's usually that end kind of in nature, it'll, it'll come to the end. But like I said, the goal is for them to kind of take the information and be able to manage their condition at home and to prevent any future exacerbations or future rehospitalizations. I know any of us in this field probably hear the rehospitalization numbers and that's a big goal for especially Medicare, Medicaid. Um, so that's most of home health and home care. Home care is gonna focus more on your assistance in your daily activities, which is more non-medical or non-clinical in nature. Sometimes you'll hear it like called personal care services, companion care, you'll hear it called homemaker services, unskilled care, custodial care. There's lots of names for it, but it's really basically the home care. Um, some of your activities of daily living are usually your hands-on care, such as assistance with your bathing, your dressing, grooming, toileting, um, mobility, eating. It might include some instrument, we call them instrumental activities of daily living, which are not hands-on, they're hands-off. Um, and it is no more your light housekeeping in those essential areas, your laundry, your meal prep, prep, transportation, and companionship. So your home care aides in some settings are able to give medication reminders, but not at all they're able to administer any medications. Um, so that's generally kind of a synopsis between home health and home care. And Jesse, you can flip to the next one. I'm going to go over some of the financial and insurance coverage that might help with this. And I'll start with home health. Home health, which is more your clinical, is considered your medical and clinically skilled. Um, therefore, Medicare, Medicaid, and a lot of your commercial insurances will cover it. It does require a physician's order and some of and some other qualifying circumstances. Medicare, for instance, um, and a lot of your other insurances will require someone to be homebound, which just means there's a documented taxing effort to leave home. And Jesse, can you flip back one screen? Yeah, right there. Um, and it might also require that new or that changed medical condition. So it might need, it might be following the hospitalization of the new diagnosis, um, the exacerbation of a current diagnosis, the fall, the fracture, some of those changes that it would require for your Medicare, your Medicaid to, to pick up and, and change. Home health also and private insurances many times follow the Medicare, Medicaid rules. I will say Medicaid under home health, unless it's changed recently, did not require someone to be homebound. So it was a little bit different. You can also pay private pay out of pocket. 
Um, it is rather expensive. I could not find an average cost of the skilled nursing visit, but I know when I worked in the area, um, it was about $130 to $160 for a skilled nurse visit. Your therapy visits could be a little more. So if it's paid out of pocket, you know, you really want it to be something valid. It's, it's a pretty extreme need if, if you need that, or if you, if you have the money, that's great. Um, and typically you still have to have the doctor's order. You may just not have to follow the other guidelines since those guidelines are not, you're paying out of pocket. So with home care, I'll switch, it, switch over now to the non-clinical and the pieces that will cover that. Medicaid does have a program that covers um, your personal care services. And under Medicaid, they do call it personal care services. CAP has a program, which is a Medicaid waiver program. The VA programs have an in-home aid and homemaker program and long-term care will cover it. Each one is regulated in its own way. So it would it'd be lengthy to go into each regulation, but each of them usually requires some combination of hands-on assistance with care. So when I say some combination, there's usually a value placed on each area of the client's activity of daily living. So for instance, the ADLs evaluated um, and given that value are usually bathing, dressing, grooming, toileting, and eating. Um, the person would be considered independent if they're able to perform the task without any setup, any supervision, any assistance. They would be considered limited assistance if they're able to perform more than half of the task with some assistance, supervision, or setup to complete it. Then they're extensive assistance if they're able to perform less than half the task and require assistance to complete it. Or of course, you can be that total care where they're not able to participate in that task. So most of your insurances and organizations require some combination of assistance in there. For example, Medicaid, I think, requires either one extensive and two limited, or they require two extensives. So you kind of get the idea. There's patterns there that also help qualify them. Um, and that kind of gives the Medicaid, but with Medicaid, um, it does require a physician to write a request. It's not necessarily an order, but it is a request. They do have a combination that they require to be qualified. Like housekeeping can be a part of the plan, but it is not a qualifying factor. So Liberty Healthcare currently holds contract to manage the personal care services in North Carolina. And a nurse from Liberty visits, evaluates and makes an assessment. And then it goes through a logarithm. And it's typically, it turns out to be two and a half to about three hours a day with a maximum of 80 hours a month that they can be approved for. So dementia diagnosis is the only way that under Medicaid, they can receive more than 80 hours a month. And if it is a qualifying Medicaid or qualifying um, dementia, Alzheimer's diagnosis, they can get up to 130 hours per month, which helps, it helps families greatly with dementia. And if you noticed in the first slide, dementia, the number of dementia in our population is increasing rapidly. So that's going to be a really big, big need in the future. Our, the CAP waiver program, like I said, is, is part of Medicaid. It also covers personal care services. And if they are approved for CAP in home, the in home portion of it with the in home aides, they do get a higher number of hours and they have case managers that will come. Um, to, they'll have case managers assess it and create that care plan. And under the CAP program, if it's adult CAP, then a spouse, a parent, or adult child can also be that caregiver because they consider that person, they're out of work, they're usually home taking care of that person. So in certain situations, they can be paid as the caregiver. 
Then your long-term care insurance, they'll also cover um, it's policy specific. So you always want to look at the insurance policy really closely. And I'm not as familiar with the long-term insurances because they're each so different, but I know you can have waiting periods or there's a designated dollar amount that's a limit for each day. So it, in each one of those, it also requires some type of combination of that hands-on assistance. Of course, home care can be paid out of pocket. I looked that one up. The average cost gave $19 an hour, and there's a wide, wide range out there. So your agencies, of course, because of overhead bonding and licensure may be a little higher. Um, so you can get a, a wide, wide range. Home health and home care, um, both. And I, I'll kind of finish up with the home care because that kind of finishes that one. But home health and home care are two services that are very resourceful in allowing our loved ones to age in place and remain in their home and in that familiar environment as long as they can until, you know, the need often arises for them to take that next step. But it is that first step in allowing them to age in place. So you can flip to my last screen, Jesse. It was just kind of a little cute couple sunset. We're walking into the sunset and we're kind of navigating through life. But thank you very much. If you have questions, just let me know. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, that was a lot of information, a lot of very good Sorry. information. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. I meant that as a compliment. <laughs> was a lot of good information um, because I think a lot of people get confused with home care versus home health and they use the terms interchangeably so you do. yes yeah. so I appreciate that um, next we have Kelly Andrews and um, Kelly has been uh, with senior care for over 20 years she's worked in hospice care and she's more recently been the executive director of senior communities in, in two states um, and each of those had a very large um, dementia component. Uh, Kelly is presently the regional director of um, A Place for Mom, and she covers four states. So she is a busy, busy lady. Uh, she's passionate about helping families navigate this senior living journey, which is obviously our focus today. Uh, so Kelly, we appreciate you being here, and she is going to talk to us about the different levels of care uh, and facilities and adult day care, memory care, all of that. So I will turn it over to you, Kelly. Okay. All right. Thank you guys for having me. Um, and so, you know, I, I talk to families every day um, and um, this is a journey um, and there are a lot of different types of care um, that can be received in different places. So um, I'm following somebody who just talked about um, home health and also um, the home care piece. And so obviously um, that is something that we can do. I think um, the piece that I'm going to go into first um, is about skilled nursing. And so the piece about skilled nursing that's important to remember for home health for, and skilled nursing, both of these, normally the order originates um, in the hospital or from your doctor. And so um, this is different than other types of care because normally you need something from the doctor. So it is common that if you spend three nights in a hospital bed um, that you are offered, if they feel that you have a skillable need, a need that needs to be taken care of by somebody with a license um, for physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, or you need med management that is to be handled by a nurse um, that you then would be referred to as a skilled nursing um, community. So long-term skilled nursing or short-term skilled nursing where that you could be getting care provided by somebody who has a license to provide that care. Um, families frequently think that if they are referred to skilled nursing that it is for long-term placement and that is not the case. Um, normally it is for just however long your insurance or Medicare will pay for you to get that level of care 
and you have to be qualified to receive it in that you have to be able to participate in what's being given. So if you are sent to skilled nursing and you cannot participate in the rehab, the physical rehab or the occupational therapy rehab or the speech therapy, then you are not going to be able to stay in that community long term in that type of bed. And so um, what happens a lot is families think when they're leaving the nursing home um, that they're going to be able to stay somewhere for a while. And depending on the type of insurance you have and what the insurance says that you can receive, um, that depends on how many days you get. And so sometimes people get 21 days, sometimes people get seven days, sometimes people get 10 days. And then families are put in a position to decide if the family member who's been receiving the care can go home independently, which was always the hope um, going in that you will be able to return independently to home or if they are going to need additional um, care. So if you need additional care and home is not the um, best option for this time frame, um, then the conversation is going to turn to then what level of care do you need and what's the best place to get that? And so um, a lot of times for families, um, they look at potentially moving into an assisted living at this point. Um, and so um, assisted living is going to help with activities of daily living. Um, you also can receive home health while you are at the assisted living. So um, maybe you were participating, but your insurance stays rent out while you were in the skilled setting. And so now um, you are able to go to an assisted living. Someone can assist you with the activities of daily living if you are not at 100%. Um, and you can also then get home health to come in and provide additional care to you. And so you're still going to get the therapy you're just going to get it set up in the assisted living arena. Home care, independent living, assisted living, memory care, residential care homes, adult day services and respite care um, are all services that um, are for the most part private pay. Um, in some states, depending on the state, some Medicare dollars are used to pay for um, assisted living or memory care, but that is state specific by how each state individually pays, um, uses their Medicaid dollars. Um, so it does change based on that. Um, assisted living, you're gonna have your own space, most likely an apartment, might be one or two rooms. Um, meals are going to be provided in a dining room setting for you. There will be outings. Um, there is usually transportation provided by the community. There are exercise classes. There are um, poker night. They have celebrations. Um, if you want to participate in activities, you absolutely can participate. Some of them have a pet that is in the community, a lot of them actually let you bring your pets there. Um, and there is always somebody in that building 24 seven who is available that if you need assistance, you can ask for it. Um, memory care is more specific. Um, memory cares were built specifically for people with dementia. Um, everything about their programming during the day is based on what would be best for somebody who has um, a cognitive decline. So um, any research that is out there and the research continues every single um, day, month, there's always new articles coming about the new, the best um, things to help somebody stay at their baseline for as long as possible with memory care. But um, all activities, the food that they eat, the different um, the different items are on the menu, the smells, everything that goes into a memory care is set up to help somebody be as independent as possible for as long as possible um, while they have a cognitive decline going on. And so I've seen communities that have used 
um, different color plates because the plates, um, the color of the plate makes you want to eat more if you see that plate. Um, I have um, seeing different activities that somebody with a cognitive decline, even playing bingo, it's not a number, um, it's a picture that um, would be very familiar. I've seen them play music bingo and the music is not music of the day, the music is, you know, the 50s, the 60s, the 40s, but something that cognitively would stimulate somebody with a decline. Um, and so, um, you would be successful because you would be able to, that music would be familiar to you from when you were in high school. Um, and so you would be successful at doing that. Um, it is much more um, hands-on as far as care. And so um, slower steps. The assumption is that at minimum you need verbal reminders to be successful. Um, and so I might come and say, you know, why don't you come with me? Um, let's get your stuff together. Um, let's get everything we need to get into the shower. Um, somebody would help you make sure that the shower water was a comfortable temperature um, and might walk you through verbally the steps of what needed to happen in order for you to be successful to give your showers. Um, if you need more hands-on care, um, there would always be also be somebody who could assist you with that. But everything is very thought out and planned to try to meet somebody where they are with their dem dementia diagnosis, but help them um, be successful in whatever is going on. Um, independent living. Um, I tell my kids all the time, I can't wait um, until I get old enough to move into an independent living community. Um, there is usually a chef um, that um, does fabulous meal prep. You do not have to eat in a dining room. Meals are can be delivered to your cottage or apartment, um, wherever you are. Housekeeping comes in. Um, your lawn is manicured for you. Um, there are outings if you're interested, and I have had seen communities where outings could be a trip that's planned an overnight stay or um, going to the ballet or, you know, something more along those lines, but um, set up to engage you, to introduce you to everybody else that lives in the community, um, you know, groups of gardening or, you know, groups that talk about all the places to the trips that they've been and they share their slides. Um, it's, it's to keep you engaged in a community where you have access if you need somebody. Almost all independent livings have at least one nurse on staff so that if you, if you were to fall, if you were to have somebody that there was availability for somebody to um, be present. A lot of the communities that I have had that had um, independent living that if we did not see somebody in their normal meals that they did, then we had a time that we just did a quick check-in um, and said, okay, you're here. I've had some communities that just had a button that came to the front desk and once somebody pushed it, then we knew um, that they were okay. Communities do that differently, um, but the people that work in the community are aware of kind of what your routine is, what you like, what's normal for you. Um, and we know when to check up if, if you don't show up to a meal that we would expect you to show up to, then, you know, somebody will come to your apartment or cottage and check in on you um, and see how you are. Um, respite care is something a lot of times that I will talk to a family about that um, the long-term plan is for somebody to go home after they've been in the nursing home and maybe even been into rehab, but Maybe something needs to be set up in the home. Maybe caregivers need to be hired. Um, and so families need a short-term option um, in order for somebody to be taken care of before they can get everything put in place um, to bring the person home. And so assisted living communities will do a short-term placement anywhere from two weeks to a month um, to kind of give everybody time to see um, what needs to be set in place. So like, do you need medical equipment? Do you need 
um, a shower retrofitted? Do you, you know, what kind of thing do you need in order to be successful? Um, and so a lot of times families do that. I have families that they just quite, they're not quite ready um, for somebody to come home after rehab because maybe it's been a shorter rehab stay than everybody would have liked. So they go to an assisted living, they do a short-term stay, they get um, home health set up while they're there, um, they get stronger and then they relocate back to home. Um, also, sometimes I have families that um, are taking care of a loved one at home, but the primary caregiver is going to go out of town. And so a family will use a assisted living to do a respite stay so that the primary caregiver can get a break and um, not completely wear themselves out. And so um, sometimes they'll do a short-term stay in assisted living to give the caregiver a break. Um, I think the only other piece that I'm going to cover is about adult daycare services. Um, and so those are places that offer support. Um, you would take your loved one to them. They have planned activities, um, meals usually, usually there is, I think, breakfast and lunch. Um, so while the caregiver is working, um, it is a safe place for um, their loved one to be um, to be engaged, to have eyes on them, for meals to be provided. Um, and so sometimes families do choose to do um, adult day services. I've seen some great programs um, in the states that I've covered that um, definitely keep people in, engaged. They do the exercise, they do art, they have people come in and speak, they have groups they can participate in. Um, and so sometimes that's a great option for somebody who needs their loved one to be plugged into um, an activity while they are working. Um, I think that pretty much covers what I'm going to cover. Um, I did on the slide that we're showing, it kind of does show about um, the different price ranges. Um, for my own personal, I have loved ones that we have taken care of. Some we have done. Um, brought in home care at home, th that is usually very expensive. I had a loved one that had a stroke. We took care of them at home for about four years. Um, and then we moved them into a community um, because socialization became the thing that was really important to us that we wanted to um, have for them. And so they have lived in a community for the last three years. Um, they do need assistance with activity of daily living. They cannot bathe themselves independently and they are, um, have some incontinence issues. Um, it's really common when someone needs to be bathed and somebody is incontinent um, that families um, look to assisted livings. That's a very normal um, with the families that I talk to that that becomes one of the things um, that families start to look for that level of care. Um, so I think that's all I have to share. Um, so Susan, I, I'll stay on. If someone else has questions for me at the end, I'm happy to answer them. Okay, perfect. So y'all send those questions. If you have questions about uh, skilled care, uh, memory care, assisted living, uh, anything that she did not go over, but uh, that was very thorough with all the levels of care. So I appreciate you being here, Kelly, and going over that. Um, Real quickly, I am going to talk about uh, palliative care and hospice care. Please don't check out on me. <laughs> My experience has been that when people hear the word hospice, they think end of life, death, dying, this is going to be depressing, and um, denial kind of sets in. But I am here to tell you that that is not what hospice is. Um, first of all, let me tell you a little bit about myself. It's kind of weird to introduce myself, but um, I have a master's in social work and I uh, am a certified dementia practitioner. I, all of my career really until the last six months has been in hospice care. I started in hospice way out of graduate school, 1991, was a social worker in the field for about 24 years and then moved into management and was a um, uh, coordinator, a care coordinator, and then most recently was an administrator for several years. Stepped away from that to care for my mom, who was on hospice two years ago. She just passed last year. 
And I'm very thankful that I came to be with the Council on Aging here in Union County, and it has been a godsend. It's been a, um, a, a nice change for me, although my roots are in hospice, and I will always be passionate about hospice, which I know some of y'all are scratching your heads and saying, how can that be? So hopefully I will be able to convince you that hospice is not a bad thing. Um, in fact, um, if you can pull up my first slide, Jesse, um, palliative care versus hospice care. A lot of people use these words interchangeably. Uh, hospice and palliative care are both um, comfort care when uh, a cure is not feasible. Uh, the difference is palliative care is that bigger umbrella and hospice care is a smaller part of that. Uh, with palliative care, with both of them, it's life limiting, like I said, and it's not curative and it's all about comfort, a very holistic approach in providing that comfort. Uh, with palliative care, however, it's not a limited prognosis. And so that person may be living for years and years. Maybe it's a type of cancer that they could live with um, eight or 10 years and they're gonna be in and out of remission. Sometimes uh, it's a disease that just has uh, pain issues that, that they know eventually uh, the person will succumb to, but it's not um, an imminent death. And so palliative care is that bigger picture. Hospice care is, a, is palliative care, but it's, it's a smaller part of that. Medicare and Medicaid do not pay for um, palliative care unless it's hospice care. And so if a person has a limited life expectancy, in fact, the physician has to be able to sign a certification saying it's six months or less, then they're appropriate for hospice. Medicare, Medicaid, private insurance, VA, just about any type of payer source would pay for hospice. And if you don't have any of those things, hospices, part of their licensure says they will provide care regardless of ability to pay. So you cannot be turned down for hospice care. Some hospices like to put it on their brochure, you know, that they give uh, care regardless of ability to pay. All of them have to do that, which is a very good thing, obviously. Um, so just keep in mind, uh, hospice is part of palliative care, but it's towards the end. And let me just say this. A lot of people get scared thinking six months, my goodness, you know, that, that's really scary. I don't want to give up. Um, I don't want my loved one to give up. That just seems very limited. I don't think they're to that point yet. Um, obviously, nobody knows if it's going to be six months. Typically, if a physician feels like it's limited and it's going to be within a year or two, I'll just be honest with you. Because with my dad, um, he had early onset Alzheimer's. We cared for him for 12 years. He was on home care for a few years and then switched to hospice. He was on hospice two years. But each certification period, which I don't, I'm not going to go into the details of all of that, but the hospice team has to come together with the medical director and certify it, certify at different intervals that they remain appropriate for hospice, that they do have six months. So you can imagine every time, you know, whether it's in 30 days or 60 days, depending on how those certs fall, the physician still says, I think it's reasonable to think they have six months, but that can go on and on for years. So just know, um, don't let the six month mark scare you. Um, we can go on to the next slide. Um, the hospice team, like I said, is very holistic, and this is the same with palliative care. Uh, a whole team of people in the center is the patient and their inner circle. I call it the inner circle. Typically on brochures, you'll see that it says uh, the patient and their caregiver, patient and their family. To me, family is a lot broader than blood relatives. Sometimes that's their next door neighbor, their best friend. Whoever those people are that are going to be in and out of the home, who are loving that person, who are available 24 seven. Sometimes people have a very limited inner circle and it's one caregiver. Sometimes people have five, seven people who are their inner circle. So hospice is looking holistically at all of those people who that person's um, health and life and eventual passing, those people that are gonna be affected by that. Um, so obviously they're in the center. Um, we have, um, we <laughs> still feel like I'm part of hospice. Um, there, there's the medical director, obviously, uh, the nurse who's the case manager. Some people are surprised to hear that hospice has physical therapy and occupational therapy because we think of that as, uh, you know, being um, aggressive and getting better. They really come in very limitedly to help with teaching the family how to transfer them or how to do uh, 
body mechanics to be safe for themselves and the person, or maybe range of motion. So it is more limited. Um, certified nursing assistants, who I always say are the heart of hospice, they're the ones going in doing that direct care, the bathing, the, the showering, the um, changing linens, just doing direct care. Um, very underpaid, but very necessary, the heart of hospice for sure. Uh, then there's social workers uh, who go in to provide that emotional support, grief counseling, uh, chaplains for the spiritual support, obviously, group of volunteers, and then grief counselors. Okay. Um, as far as what, I put hospice Medicare benefit because really it's this, almost identical with Medicaid. And most insurance companies, just like Zondra said with home care, they follow what Medicare provides. But the, um, the hospice benefit includes any medications related to the terminal diagnosis. They have that primary diagnosis and often a secondary diagnosis. So um, that would be paid 100%. Plus anything that's secondary to that, which would be things like insomnia, pain, anxiety, because that's due to the terminal disease. The things that would not be covered would be things, for example, if you had um, a person who dementia was their terminal diagnosis and they had diabetes, they're not gonna cover insulin. So if it's completely unrelated, um, that would not be covered. Also covers durable medical equipment, hospital beds, wheelchairs, bedside commodes, all of that. Covers incontinent supplies. Also covers, some people aren't aware of this, and I'm not gonna get into the details of hospice having four different levels of care because we don't have enough time for that, but. Um, it will cover short-term inpatient care for pain management. So if a person just can't get pain managed at home, they can go into the hospital or into a hospice house uh, and receive, maybe they need um, you know, infusion, uh, morphine by IV, things like that, that the family is just uh, really nervous about at home or sometimes simply can't get it managed. And they can go in for that with the goal being to come home and pass at home. Uh, there's also short-term respite, a lot of people don't know about. Uh, that is when the hospice patient can go, <clears throat> excuse me, can go into a facility for five days for the family just to kind of catch their breath. Sometimes, you know, there's a, a wedding or they just need to get away. And um, so that's a benefit. It, it, so really with the goal being that if we give that family a break to, to where they can regroup, get regrounded, they can, the person can come back home and they can stay the course and be in the home uh, because they had time for some self-care. So that short-term respite uh, is a, a wonderful benefit. And then there's bereavement care for, for a full year after the passing. Um, I just wanna speak to the hospice myths because as I go over all of that, you might still be scratching your head saying that still sounds pretty, pretty depressing uh, at the end of life. Um, but that's because there are hospice myths. My experience has been almost everybody believes these. So I'm gonna try to dispel them today. Um, and those are that hospice focuses on death and dying, hospice is patient-centric, and that hospice's primary goal, and really some people feel like the only goal is to address physical pain. So if my loved one doesn't have pain, or if I don't wanna talk about death and dying, why on earth would I want hospice? Okay, next slide, <laughs> and I will tell you why. First of all, hospice affirms life. Hospice is about living as fully as you can for as long as you can. The hospices that I was a part of as a social worker, I would go in and say, what is on your bucket list? And if those were things, you know, sometimes they were things that we could not accomplish, you know, especially if it involved travel or, or whatever. But oftentimes we could come up with a compromise or something, you know, still that would be similar. And sometimes we could uh, meet, the, meet those, uh, those last wishes. So it really is about, affirming life and making sure that that person can live fully uh, with as much joy as possible, which I know may sound unrealistic, but I've seen it, it can happen, um, so that they're able to enjoy the time that they have left. What a lot of people don't realize is that studies show that people, they've done studies where uh, they've compared people who are, um, have the same diagnosis, same um, prognosis as far as what they think the longevity is. And um, then they compare somebody who goes by the hospice philosophy, is admitted to hospice and dies on hospice versus the person who does not wanna talk about death, does not go on hospice. And the person on hospice has significantly longer life. 
which surprises people. <laughs> uh, but I, you know, I feel like, uh, and of course, most people agree in, in the hospice and healthcare world, it's because that person is surrounded by a whole team of healthcare workers who are coming in and helping, not just with the physical pain, but with the whole dynamic of the, the family and helping them to accept what's happening and helping them hopefully to get to a, a place of peace and acceptance. And then by doing that, the person lives longer because they don't have that high stress. They don't always have that adrenaline of, of dread. Instead, I don't want to get into the details, but they actually increase their oxytocin levels where they're more peaceful. And they, um, they really are able to reach a place to where they can slowly let go and, uh, and have a peaceful passing. And so it's not just about quality, it's also about quantity. Um, the other myth uh, that um, it's patient-centric, it is somewhat, I'm kind of splitting hairs here, but I really believe that hospice is, like I, I said, it's that inner tribe, that inner circle focused on all of them because we have had, um, back when I used to do hospice admission, sometimes the family would say, well, you know, they're in a nursing home, they're getting excellent care here, we know that they're not in pain, so why would we need hospice? They're gonna pass here. Well, it's because you're gonna have a social worker, you're going to have a chaplain, you're going to have bereavement care, you're going to have people who that's what they do is walk people home. They're there for the last months and last weeks and they are strangely <laughs> strangely comfortable um, in doing that. And so it's nice to have those people around you um, when you're in the throes of grief and when all of that is raw and saying your goodbyes that they're able to weep with you but they're also able to help you see that there's going to be a future without that person. And um, that's very valuable. So I always say it's not patient-centric. <laughs> yes, that person obviously is important, but it's about that whole, that whole circle of people that's going to be affected when that person passes on and is no longer here on earth. Um, finally, um, the myth that hospice focuses on, the number one priority is pain management. And I've heard that a lot. <laughs> and actually, hospice, a good hospice, doesn't just focus on pain management. We focus, we, <laughs> it's a hard habit to break. Uh, hospices focus on addressing all suffering. And suffering includes the physical, the emotional, and the spiritual. And I have been with many people who the spiritual and emotional suffering is much greater than the physical pain. So that's why you have that whole team of people the social worker, the chaplain, the grief counselor, the nurse, the medical director, all rallying around to provide that love and support. So um, just know if you ever uh, need in the future hospice care, if you have a loved one and you're struggling with, I don't want to give up, um, you know, I want them to fight. Hospice is not about giving up. It's not about uh, not fighting. We like to use the term hospice is about letting go. And sometimes that letting go happens very slowly over months and months, or even like I said, a year or two. Um, but again, it's telling that person, it's okay not to fight, let's just rest. And when people can get in a place where they're like, okay, now it's about resting and enjoying this time versus fighting and trying to get better. There, it's amazing how you can just sense this feeling of peace coming over the family. Of course, no one can tell you when that day when it's time for that. But um, for me, and I'm going to say this, and I'm going to, uh, we'll move on to the VA. Um, for me, if, if that person is no longer having um, a lot of quality and joy, and they're fighting to hang on, sometimes that's the key. Okay, it's time for hospice. They need to have permission, but let's just rest. Let's just enjoy this time together. Um, and um, with dementia, there's a whole uh, different element and criteria. In fact, I think um, I'll, I'll mention this real quickly. We were talking about um, each of the, the speakers have spoken today. And again, we're about to hear the two guys from the VA. I think each of us could have done a full hour. And so we may go back and do that because uh, I could just ramble on and on, but I'm not. I'm going <laughs> to close and turn this over uh, to the VA. And um, I am going to introduce um, Robert. Uh, Robert Turner, uh, there's going to be two. They're tag teaming at Robert Turner and Octavius Rory um, are both veteran service officers with the VA. And Robert served in the U.S. Army for 12 years, deploying twice in support of Iraqi freedom. So thank you, Robert, for your service, sincerely. Um, 
He began with Union County as a senior accounting specialist for DSS in 2017. He has a bachelor's degree in business administration with a concentration in accounting. He's from Fort Hood, Texas, and is married with two children. Octavius Rory uh, was born and raised in Union County. He has an administrative, um, was an administrative assistant. Uh, let me repeat this. <laughs> he was an administrative specialist with the United States Navy as a yeoman for 20 years. After retirement, he worked in the Union County Tax Office as deputy tax collector, but he wanted to do more to help those who he had served uh, with and who had served before him and after him. So he did an internal transfer from the tax office to veteran service. So how awesome is that? <laughs> That's very admirable. He has an associate's degree in human resource management and a bachelor's in business administration with a concentration in HR. He's married with four children and one granddaughter. So we, I'm gonna turn it over to Robert and Octavius to share about uh, what the VA has to offer us. Hello, first of all, thank you for having us. It was uh, a great pleasure to be here again. Uh, so who are we? Um, we're Veteran Services, we work for Union County. Um, we're accredited representatives through the VA. Uh, our mission statement is to provide Union County veterans and their families access to federal, state, and county benefits and entitlements based on their service in the United States Armed Forces and Auxiliary Forces. My apologies, I jumped right ahead, got into it. Um, so this is the vision. Uh, Michelle Lancaster is actually our, our deputy county manager. Our director is Michelle. And uh, we have three other veteran services officers, myself, Octavius, and James Anderson, and our administrative support specialist uh, who runs the, the office and administrative side of things is Vicki Griffin. So if these are, these are just kind of the population. Um, as of tonight, 2019, we don't have any updated uh, numbers as of yet. Um, but as you can say, in Union County here, we serve about a little over 12,000 um, veterans. So it's not including their, um, the families. Just kind of a layout, the Division of Veteran Services is broken down into uh, different services. Under the Veterans Affairs, you have the Pension um, Maintenance Center, who deals strictly with pension. You have the hospital, VA healthcare, and then you have disability, um, who processes all the service compensation, the service-connected disability claims. <clears throat> so what do we do? We provide an overview of veterans' benefits. We process health care applications, coordinating um, getting veterans health care care through the VA. We process and assist disability claims. We process and service uh, pension claims, and we assist with surviving spouse claims along with their, along with dependents. So we assist with retired military benefits, burial arrangements, flags, markers, education claims. We work with our transportation department to provide transportation to VA clinics and VA approved civilian doctor's appointments. So if they're referred out to community care, uh, we process those as well and work with our transportation to get them to those appointments. And we do referrals to community agencies for assistance. Uh, there's a large network NC serves Unitas that we serve and uh, we process a lot of referrals through there and we receive a lot of referrals through there as well. Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Octavius, who will start his discussion on disability claims. All right. Thank you, Robert. So uh, first, we're going to be speaking about uh, VA compensation. And VA defines compensation as uh, the monthly compensation benefits for a service-connected disability. So the basic eligibility is in order to be eligible for a service-connected disability compensation, a veteran must uh, have been 
discharged under conditions other than dishonorable. There is no minimum time uh, length of service required to receiving a service connected disability. To establish service connection, the evidence must show that an injury or disease was incurred in service, or if it was a pre existing condition that it was aggravated while you were in the service. So to request these, uh, the request of compensation, the veteran needs to come in and uh, fill out a form 21526EZ, which is a claim for the, uh, to request an application for service connected compensation. So in order to get uh, service connected, there are three things that, have to, um, that you have to have. One is a current diagnosis of the disability an in-service event or an injury, and a nexus statement. So a current disability is a, I mean, a current disability is a diagnosis from a, a physical or mental health condition, which could come from a, a non-VA doctor or it could, could come from a, a, say you were going to a therapy or somewhere and they, uh, they made a, a diagnosis that you had a certain injury. The next thing you're gonna need is that in-service event or injury and this is the incident that's happened while you're in the service that caused the condition or made the condition manifest during your service, but not as a result of a veteran's willful misconduct. So that means you can't be, you could be doing something wrong, like uh, you have an accident and you lose your leg, but it was due to you um, having a DUI. You will not get compensation for that because it was considered a uh, willful misconduct. Um, an incident can be anything as long as the veteran was on active duty at the time of the incident. So if you're on a, in a car accident and you were you were injured because you were on active duty, that could be service connected. Uh, for evidence, all you have to have is uh, your service treatment records can show that you uh, had the injury while you're in the military, or you can do what they call a uh, lay evidence, which is statements from the veteran or the buddy or a buddy that was in the military with you that has firsthand knowledge or facts or about the circumstances that uh, caused your injury. Now, the next statement is pretty much a statement from a physician that links the current condition and the in-service incident or manifest manifestation of a condition. And the evidence must demonstrate that is as likely as not that the current disability is connected to your in-service injury or an event. Now, the disability compensation is, like I said before, is a monthly monetary benefit payable for service-connected uh, disabilities. Compensation rates are not income-based, but are determined by the level of impairment and the severity of that disability. The uh, possible range is from zero to 100 percent, and they go up in 10 percent increments. Once a veteran is combined, has a combined evaluation of 30 percent or greater, and becomes he be, he or she becomes eligible to add dependents to their claim for additional compensation. Now you can receive compensation for your spouse and dependent children up to the age of 18, but not older than 23. Um, if older than 18, they have to be attending an approved school in order to continue to see, uh, receive the uh, additional compensation. Uh, the compensation range could be from $142 to $3,106 a month, depending on the severity of the uh, service-connected disability. Right now, the process and times for um, new disability claims is usually between eight to 12 months, unless there are some kind of uh, extenuating circumstances where they're still trying to look for uh, additional uh, evidence to support your claim. Now, once the service connection is established, a veteran that's rated 50% uh, or greater will be automatically enrolled into the VA healthcare system. But we always recommend that the veteran contacts the, uh, the VA and let them know, hey, I'm in receipt of my 50% uh, or greater service connection letter. So you'll get assigned a uh, primary healthcare physician. Next slide. So now we're going to go into the, the actual VA health care. Now, uh, VA will provide health care, including medical or other treatment as required to eligible veterans. 
VA medical facilities may also provide health care for certain veterans dependents covered under CHAMP VA, as well as military personnel, uh, retirees, and their families if they're covered under TRICARE and if staffing and space uh, permits. Uh, VA will also furnish needed care for eligible children of Vietnam veterans who have problems related to uh, spina bifida and certain other birth defects. To be eligible for the VA health care, uh, veterans must be discharged under conditions other than dishonorable. Uh, VA will provide health care to certain persons who receive other than honorable discharges, but only for a disability which was incurred in or aggravated by service in the line of duty. To obtain benefits for uh, the VA health care, the veteran must complete what they call a, uh, a VA 1010 easy form, which is an application for health benefits. Now, this can be completed at a VA medical facility, or they can come into the local VA service office, and we can uh, assist in filling that form out and get it submitted to uh, VA health care. So now, once the VA receives your, your uh, application, and if you're approved, you're placed into uh, eight, one of the eight priority groups that VA have uh, established. So priority groups one and three are reserved for veterans with compensable service-connected disabilities, the former prisoners of war, Purple Heart recipients, and Medal of Honor recipients. Priority groups four through six are reserved for veterans receiving aid and assistance, uh, pension, uh, they have Medicaid benefits, they're, they served in uh, the Vietnam or Gulf War, or they were exposed to radiation or the Camp Lejeune water contamination. Now the priority groups seven and eight are both income-based and therefore veterans who agree to pay um, co-pays. Now for priority groups seven and eight, they're based on budgetary resources and they may be deferred or discontinued on a year-to-year -year basis. So it's renewed every year. Uh, upon enrollment, the veteran will be assigned to one of the priority groups and is eligible for needed inpatient, outpatient, medical, surgical, and psychiatric services, including but not limited to drugs and pharmaceutical supplies, home health care, and hospice care. The veteran may choose a preferred facility for receiving primary care if it's available. Uh, the closest we have to our location will be the VAMC up in Charlotte off of uh, Tavola Road. And there's another one, uh, VAMC Charlotte North, which is in the university area. And like I said, the enrollment is for one year and is automatically renewed each year unless the veteran requests that it not be renewed. And one thing I just want to reiterate is um, if a veteran is rated 50% or more disabled or unemployable due to a service-connected condition, they're automatically enrolled into the VA healthcare system. Right now, applications for enrollment to VA healthcare are taking around four to six weeks to get approved. Uh, the VA also uh, offers long-term care. Now, this service includes 24-7 nursing and medical care, physical therapy, assistance with daily tasks like bathing, dressing, making meals, and taking medicine, uh, comfort care and pain management, support for caregivers who need skill help or a break to work, travel, or run errands. This care can be provided in uh, many different settings, nursing homes, assisted living center centers, private homes where a caregiver supports a small group, uh, adult day health centers, uh, and it can also be in the veteran's home. To be eligible for the services, the veteran has to be signed up for VA healthcare. So they have to be in the VA healthcare system. And the VA has concluded that the veteran needs a specific service to help with ongoing treatment and personal care. And there is a space in the care setting for the service. Uh, the, VSA, the VA will also cover some, uh, some of these services under the standard health benefits, if you are signed up for the VA healthcare, there may still be a copay for some covered services. Other services that aren't covered by the VA healthcare benefits may be paid through Medicare, Medicaid, or another private insurance. So, and I'll be around to answer any questions that you have on um, VA healthcare or compensation at the end of the, uh, the presentation. Robert? Is he still here or did he leave me? I'm right here. <laughs> Thanks, Octavius, for that. Appreciate it. 
Um, so pension claims. What are pension benefits? So pension is a need-based benefit. It is paid to wartime veterans and their survivors with financial needs. Uh, if you are a veteran, you are eligible for, for pension if all the following are true. So one, you have to have been discharged with um, under other than dishonorable conditions. You had to have served 90 days of active duty with at least one day during wartime. But that doesn't mean you had to be participating in the war. It just means you had to serve during a war period. Uh, your countable income is below the maximum annual pension rate, and you meet the net worth limitations, and you are one of the following. You are 65 or older, or you have a permanent and total non-service connected disability. You are a patient in a nursing home due to mental or physical incapacity, or you are receiving social security disability benefits. Um, so spouses can also fly upon the death of the veteran as long as the veteran met those requirements. We have, it comes, there's three different levels of pension. There's basic housebound and aid and attendance. Uh, so aid and attendance is an increased monthly pension amount. It can be paid to either the veteran or surviving spouse. And you're eligible for aid and attendance if you are eligible for basic pension benefits and one of the following is true. You require uh, aid to perform daily living activities. You're bedridden. You are a patient in a nursing home due to mental or physical incapacity. You have corrected visual acuity of 5 to 200 or less in both eyes. And you have a concentric contraction of visual field of 5 degrees or less. And then housebound is an increased monthly pension amount. It's paid to veterans or surviving spouses who is confined to their home because of a permanent disability. You may be eligible for housebound benefits if you are eligible for basic pension benefits and you have a 100% disabling permanent disability and due to this disability, you are confined to your home or you have one disability evaluated 100% disabling and another evaluated as at least 60% disabling, which actually applies to uh, disabled um, compensation disability service connection. So um, claims do take about eight to 12 months for decisions. Pension is probably one of our most in-depth applications that we do, just because it requires a lot of proof of income, uh, proof of net worth, bank statements, so security statements. So we need a lot of paperwork and backup to support the claim as it goes through the process. And it's a lot easier and more efficient if we get all of that on the front end of the application before submitting it. So that's pretty much pension in a nutshell. So how do we get um, our word out? Well, we attend marketing briefings um, at different American Legion posts, VFW posts. We also um, attend coffee houses in the area. Currently, there are uh, three coffee houses. There's SPCC, which is the third Wednesday of every month, and I believe they're changing that. Um, don't quote me on that, but I think that's changing. And then there's the Lee Park Veterans Ministry. They're there on the third Saturday of every month. There's Waxhaw Baptist Church, and they're on the fourth Thursday of every month. And those are the ways that we really communicate out and get, you know, word of mouth. That's that's how we get most of our interaction and most of our references is by veterans and their family members talking to each other and sharing their word with other veterans. Uh, that seems to be the most successful way, especially with the majority of our veterans still being the Vietnam era and technology not being the forefront of that quite. So that's how we get our, our word out and just distribute our information. So we're located at uh, 407 North Main Street, which is the old historic post office. We're on the right side of the building as you go in. Uh, we're open Monday to Friday, 0800-1700. And our main desk number is 283-3807. Appointments are, uh, we are working on appointment basis right now. Uh, and then uh, 
dictating the director's approval, we, we do home visits. So if you have any questions, we're here for you and uh, we'd love to answer any questions that you have. Thank y'all so much. That was um, a lot of good information. I appreciate um, all the presenters. I know uh, for those of you who have been listening, that was a lot of information. So just know we are going to uh, answer questions now. Um, if any of you who are listening would like um, to have the, the either um, the PowerPoint presentation or slides, just email me if you want a specific one or if you want them.